Tanya, let's start with you. Tell us sure. a little bit about your experience. Um, so I, I was on the panel last year, 2019, uh, for SICE. Um, SICE stands for? Uh, computer information system. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you'll probably know to which part of NSF you're applying to. So um, yeah, I was um, I reviewed eight proposals. Um, I saw more than that. I saw all of the proposals that were. Um, reviewed on the panel and ended up reviewing eight of them. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, that's a good start so some people know that you get your experience. Oh, and I, I also received the NSF Career Award the year after, before that, 2018. So like being on the panel the year after kind of enlightened me a lot about what was going on behind the scenes. So it was, it was good to see both sides and okay. kind of understand the process. Okay, I'm in nuclear physics, and actually for us, even the larger um, funding agencies, the Department of Energy, and I've had a good bit of experience with both, in some ways more experience with the Department of Energy, other than details about how NSF wants all of this. Uh, the fact is the, the reviewers are going to be sometimes the same people thinking in the same way. Uh, so I, I most recently reviewed a career proposal, just mail review, about, about last fall, I guess, and uh, I have been on others. I have been on DOE panels, which actually did not were not specifically for DOE. Also has a has something like the career uh, program, which some people think is easier to get into than the NSF program. Uh, so. I've, I've seen a moderate amount, it's sitting, as she said, sitting on panel, it's very interesting to hear how other people on the panel are reacting. In this case, for DOA, it was mixed between uh, uh, people who've been around as long as me and, and uh, young people just trying. And I would say there was a lot of sympathy to the young investigators, but at the same time, there were just a lot of, of signs of inexperience that were going to make make it difficult to, to be able to fund. And I will hit you up with some, what some of this looks like in just a moment. Okay, so uh, Luke Catavesta, mechanical engineering. Um, I have been on, I think, I'll, I didn't do it last year because of, I had a conflict, but I had done the previous six years of the career uh, in the CBEC program, which is part of engineering. And, um, so I have a lot of experience with NSF and panels. Um, generally speaking, I would say this, that I also review typically five to seven. There's on the order of six of us on the panel any given year. So that means you're seeing about 40 or so submitted to within our program. This was generally under fluid dynamics subgroup. And depending on the year, uh, as little as two and as many as four, sometimes five, so you get an idea of the ratio. Um, I've seen different program managers over that time frame. Generally speaking, I think they try and put together a panel that is um, very much interested in helping cultivate young faculty members. So they're very sensitive to the process that you go through. Um, if you've ever probably heard from some of your colleagues, I've been on other NSF panels where that's not the case. It's a very competitive process in all these, but sometimes you can have a, somebody who tries to take over the panel and has very strong opinions. In my experience with a career, the program manager really tried to put together a panel that uh, would work well together, knew each other quite well, and uh, would listen to each other and really come in with sort of an open mind. So you've been on other NSF panels as well as career? Yes. So can you tell me, for the ones that end up getting funded, what is the difference between 
those that you reviewed for a regular career and those that you review for an NSF career? What are you looking for different, or what could be a flaw that people aren't doing differently? I would say the number one thing that was already brought up by somebody with a question is, at least within engineering, we're really looking for an integrated research and education plan. Really, not two separate things, and not an oh by the way education plan, which we see a lot of. You really have to distinguish. Generally speaking, you can imagine people who are coming into this like yourselves, leveraging an idea that is probably state of the art, and you're one of the best out there doing it. So you get a lot of really good technical ideas. The research is kind of hard to decipher, but what generally distinguishes a lot of these is really the education plan. And uh, that, I would say, is the main difference compared to other NSF, where obviously you have to do broader impacts, but, um, and it's, but the education <coughs> component and the integration of it, I think, is the key distinguishing factor. Sam, sorry, do you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that statement. Um, definitely, I mean, I've seen, I've seen proposals with strong educational components and some that did not have strong educational components and definitely it's a detractor. I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't get the NSF career because I've seen also proposals that were very strong from a research point of view, but the educational plan was so and so and they still got the career award, but I would say that those are the exceptions rather than the rule. Um, so yeah, the, the educational component is really important and the broadening participation in computing is also very important. Um, I would also add to that that um, what I've noticed differently from serving on, on, on different NSF panels was the fact that people were looking at the person as a whole. Um, so in, on other panels, you're really looking at the proposal itself and what the research that they're proposing <coughs> is on, on that uh, grant and I mean, they have the, uh, the background to do it and the experience, but here it's even more important. So what I've noticed in a lot of the proposals, and also included in my own proposal when I submitted and got funded, was um, kind of a vision for my entire career. Um, so kind of started with that and then blended in the, the current proposal, the career proposal, into that long-term vision for you know, as long as you can foresee uh, that you'll be working in the field. And I, I think that that was also an important part um, that people considered and saw that, okay, this is not just like, you know, um, a research trajectory that will end after the five years, but it's really something that sustains this uh, person's career long term and it integrates well with their vision uh, of themselves as a researcher and as an educator long term. So I hear you saying it's somewhere there it should say, this will lay the foundation for my future. I've seen that mentioned a lot, and I think the reviewers appreciated that, appreciated the, the vision um, that people would um, um, describe for them. Sam, would you like to add to that? I'm a little less familiar with, with what happens in, in that sense. I know that NSF requires a lot of, for all proposals, of broader impacts and such, and you have to write something. Because other, I would say this, think of your poor reviewers. They have to write something for their reviews. Give them, give them ammunition, to put it simply. Although I would say that, that in physics, most of us tend to look more at the, more at the scientific directions. And of course, as she, exactly as she says, you are talking about not a not a shotgun off, try this, I'll try that. You're talking about this is going to be my career. This is how it will help me. Uh, I would say, I already heard some mention about, well, you can put a postdoc in here, but I remember we looked fairly negatively on postdocs, but I think that, that uh, graduate student support, graduate student development is gold, and, and somewhat cheaper. Uh, for us, it's, I would say when our grants, it's about uh, two grad students to the postdoc. And sometimes the grad students are better. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I've, oh, I've had some excellent postdocs written yeah. at all. Let's open it up to questions. Yeah, just because you raised the issue of, of student funding, so um, I specifically have an idea for a project that would involve the research that my current graduate student has already started doing. So is that a typical or acceptable situation to sort of say, like, it's not just in a way my project, but it's also my student's project? Would that oh, be good or bad? Or all of my projects are not my projects. They're all my students. So, I mean, certainly when I talk about them. So yes, I think it's I think it's golden to say you, this person is just starting, and now you're working closely with them, and this is what you need. Yeah, I, I would agree that it's it's more than acceptable. It's um, what I would say. It's um, proposals that I've seen that had already something. I mean, it's it's not as much as, you know, just something started and some preliminary results, even if they're very preliminary, um, generally fared better than those that had nothing on that topic before. So um, if, if there's a project which you already started with the graduate students, whether you have a publication or not yet on that topic, I don't think it's that important rather than showing that it's at least the first few steps are feasible. And I don't think that, um, again, it's so important as for other proposals on other types of panels that I've seen, but, but it is important to have something uh, from, from what I've seen on the panel that I've served on. So I, I would say that it's probably encouraged. Well, can you elaborate, um, in your opinion, what makes a good education plan? Is it innovation in the idea, or is it prior evidence I can take a shot at this to start. Uh, both those are excellent points, and I would say probably equally valid. So, uh, innovation. So, if you think about it, if you pull the room, we could probably come up with a handful of ideas that you would say, yeah, I'm going to do that. So, doing something that's a little different, but striking as impactful, is definitely useful. And the other aspect that I would say for us, that I've seen over the years, is not just saying you're going to do this, but to have started to do it. You've done this as maybe as a graduate student or as a postdoc yourself. You've been involved in these activities. You have some collaborations that are already established. You don't have to do this all yourself. That's the other part. So within the university, we have components that assist you with education plans, K through 12, use them. Get involved in that a year or two before you ever submit this, so you lay the foundation for doing this. Then it's not only just a good idea, it's clear that you're passionate about it and you're, you're gonna do it, and you are doing it. And, and that, that resonates with the panel. And since this is in July, and you're thinking, oh no, I have it. We are gonna have a panel with two people that can get involved and assist, and so even starting now and figuring out what that looks like and getting something going can still be oh, yeah. good. And I can tell you, I've seen reviews come back from people that say, you know, things like, you say you're going to do this, but you, there's no clear plan how. You know, it sounds good, but it doesn't look like you thought this out. So you, you just can't throw something up that I'm going to try this. You know, it's really nice. Um, for example, you know, there's a existing program here at FSU, and you're going to join them that's already going and successful and something like that. I know some people in engineering have partnered with the Magnet Lab, for an example, and they're, they're like girls, I forget, Cy girls, something like that. There's a lot of different things. One thing I'll say real quick, um, if you don't already know, we have examples of all the successful proposals, all the proposals that have been awarded for career on our NSF toolkit. Not to take ideas from, but to kind of get an idea of what successful ones have looked like and what kind of uh, plans they put forward, which can be helpful. I forgot one other thing that I wanted to mention. I'm sorry. Oh, did I? Assessment. Mm -hmm. Having something in your proposal where you quantify and explain how you're going to assess how well you're 
particularly on, obviously in research, we, we kind of know how to do that, but in education, that's key. So assessment, some idea of how well you're doing. Rather than, hey, I just, I just thought I would try, I just thought I'd try to throw something out. I mean, I can just tell you that's maybe a little off base. I've also reviewed a number of, of small business initiative proposals for the, for the Department of Energy. And uh, so much I, I see things like a solution in search of a problem. I see, uh, oh, there's a paragraph uh, about uh, the need of a particular, a particular program. So they just copy that and the rest of it has clearly been, been, been copied from the six other proposals they wrote last week. It, it, I mean, a reviewer can, can see this pretty clearly. Yeah, so it's basically a ratio of what is exploratory and what is established that we have to Well, you have about. to indicate you know, you, you understand what has been established, and you understand where the questions are that remain or some of them. Now, I don't know if this is true of any other fields, but in both nuclear and particle physics, there are national programs, that, national panels that set the priorities for the field for the next five years. And it's very valuable to be able to show how, how your work relates to national priorities. I suspect, even if it's not as formal, other, other research uh, disciplines have some kind, of, some kind of programs. Maybe National Academy of Sciences has stated things, I don't know. Say that if you think of two words, one is incremental and one's transformative. The closer you can get to transformative in your scientific proposal, the better off you're going to be. But you have to base it in a solid hypothesis, a literature review, a pretty sound argument that says, here's exactly what I think we're going to do. If we do this, this is the impact that this will have. This is how it will change how people go about it. Because if it's just incremental, it's not going to bubble to the top. Yeah, I completely agree with that. That's what I've been seeing, um, that there is some preliminary work, but just enough to kind of set the work in, in context. But yeah, it, it generally was some transformative idea or something rather novel, um, rather than just improving a little bit the state of the art, or, you know, taking something and yeah, just taking it a little bit further. And and yeah, in describing the problem and really setting the context was extremely extremely important. Um, I mean, in the solution, you know, like maybe you omit a couple, you know, a few details here and there. I, don't, I didn't find that to be as important as really setting this uh, and giving the context and like really you know emphasizing why this is important and why you know um, your approach would actually you know you think it will work and how will that impact the you know you can go as 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 broad as you want even like you know society at large but even in your field so I feel like that. Those first two pages where you explain these things are extremely important. So, do you think it's a good yeah. idea to kind of reach out to the program manager a couple of months ahead of time, explain your idea, and get some sort of feedback? Is that something that you would suggest? I don't think it hurts. Um, again, like don't send an entire proposal for them to look over. Um, but I think it, it doesn't hurt. I never did that, but I've heard other people that have done that, um, and you know they get good feedback. Uh, also, um, it's important after the fact. Like if you submit the first time, you know, and even second time, and you get rejected. Um, for me, I I got funded the second time I submitted it. For me, it was very important to get feedback after the fact from the program director as well. And the program director that's um, kind of in charge of the program where I submit um, is very good at giving more context about what should you be doing to revise your, your proposal for the next round. And um, he will be very blunt about you need to find another idea or 
it's a good idea, you just didn't present it the right way. So I think it's important even, like, you can go ahead and ask, you know, about the idea, maybe set, like, a, a one-page max, I would say, uh, just to get the general idea if it's something that, um, you know, his or her um, unit would be interested in, you know, like, it's, it's within the goals of the, the topics that they're currently interested in, but it's also important after the fact if, I hope not, you know, but if it happens that you get rejected, it's important to get the feedback right after, as soon as possible after the fact, so that you can work on revising it for the next round. The program, let me just say quickly, the program advisors, are, are, are managers are actually very sensitive to this, and they, and they, they will uh, sort of bend over backwards to, to try to give you ideas, et, et cetera. I've, I've watched this happen. In our case, it has more to do with young faculty joining a group, and they really, you, I really felt immediately they 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 felt their duty was to focus more on the young, the very young faculty. So I'm sure they'll be willing to give you a piece of their mind, and and anyone can make an make an appointment. Uh, I haven't been to the new NSF headquarters, but I believe it's just two stops on Metro from from DCA Airport, so that it's easy to get there. Make an appointment in advance. If you'll make an appointment in advance, I'm sure they'll they'll spend an hour with you, and it would never hurt. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of wondering at a meta level, like who reviews it in what context. Right? So, I, as 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 a context for the question, I was recently in a panel um, where we reviewed a bunch of career proposals that were mixed in with mostly not career proposals. So I felt like the career proposals were competing with non-career proposals. Is that typical, or should the normal situation be that you're competing against other career proposals primarily? That's I've never seen yeah. anything other than career separate by itself. Huh. That's typical in bioethnic monarchies looking for a Okay. So maybe for that director, it will be doing that. I have noticed that from hearing other panelists that you can have differences. The, the example I gave the Department of Energy panel was not not for what well, DOE has another name for it, uh, uh, but it was not for such people. It was just for someone <coughs> who was for a grant uh, through the through the regular research support. And I would say there was a lot of sympathy, but it, but there there were so many problems with the scientific proposals that I think we were unable to recommend any of them. But I'd like if someone is, wants to hire two postdocs and, and, and they were just a postdoc last year. But simple, simple as that. So on, on the panel that I've been on, there were career proposals and CRII proposals. That's for like starting uh, assistant professors in their first, I think, two years now or three years. Um, I forgot what it stands for, but it's CRII, and that's really when you start as an assistant professor, you have a few years to apply for this grant, which is, I think, around $200,000, just to get you started, which it can be useful in preparing for your NSF career submission. So I've seen people that have used the CRII grant as a starting point to get uh, preliminary results and then use those results in their NSF career proposal submission. Um, so those type of proposal, it was still beginning uh, you know, assistant professors in both pots um, um, of, of proposals, of both piles, but we were given specific instructions on how to evaluate each and not basically compare between them. I wanted to add, if I could, uh, as the question about reaching out to the program managers, and I would say absolutely. If for no other reason they can, they'll know the name maybe the face. And I also, th I know from my own experience, the program manager that I've worked with actually use this information early on to form the panel. They make sure they have the expertise there to review because in fluid dynamics it's so broad that they want to make sure they have people that can cover these different areas. And I'll, I'll add on to that, usually when we're having these, and I think you'll hear it from the other panel too, is, is we, we try to help people, you know, ahead of time when you have your idea, we recommend sending a one-pager 
to the program officer that you think it's going to be and say, could I schedule a time to talk about this? Um, and he could tell you, you know, if it seems appropriate, if maybe it needs to be in a different direct, it would be more appropriate for a different directorate. But having that ahead of time, you know, you can't ask questions like, would you fund this if I did this? You know, you can't do that. But but is this appropriate? Does this does this research seem appropriate for what you're doing? And just having that ahead of time, you know, you you get three shots at this, right? You would hate your first shot being that you're in the wrong place, right? So it pays to have that discussion. And like what Sonia said, if it happens that you aren't funded the first time, yes, you get these reviews back with all this information, but it's so important also to have that call again with the program person because they can tell you things that may not be there, you know, um, could give you some advice that could really be helpful. Um, and then listen to it. You know, I remember having a conversation with a faculty member who the first time they did it, they they were not scored as well as they could have been, but there was some constructive advice, you know, and he, he didn't contact the person. Actually, I think he did contact the person, but basically he didn't say it wasn't out of line with that. It was just needed some work, right? So he interpreted it as, I need to jump to a different directorate. And the second time, he went to a different directorate and was slaughtered because he was in the wrong place. So now you're at time three, you know, and then you feel a little nervous because you have your third shot and you could have had two good feedbacks or been funded. So make sure you're listening to what they're telling you. And, you know, if you need help interpreting, reading between the lines of what somebody said, talk it out. Talk it out with people in your area of, like, he said this. What do you think that means? Can I add to that? Any other? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with everything that you said. And I, I did have that talk with the program director after um, after my first try uh, got rejected, um, didn't get funded. And he was very good at giving advice on what I should work on for my second submission. And I think that talk was really instrumental in me getting funded the second time. because. Everything that he told me was not in the reviews. And so what, what is the best way to have these conversations? Over phone or in person? So, so I taught, I met the program director at one at the conference that I attended. So I approached him there and we talked there. But and I think any means like over the phone would be okay. Meeting with them in person, I think, would also be okay. Okay, I think it's, I mean, not over email. I would say, okay. um, but. It's important, no matter how you talk to them, that you have a conversation with them over the phone or in person. Um, sorry, but if you can, um, can you try to explain us like what was the suggestion that the so, told you sure. to so, so, um, he he believed that the idea was good. I mean, it wasn't like I have to switch to a, something something completely different. But I didn't make the case for it very. Well, so I didn't describe the problem. I didn't put it in context in the right way. So he advised me that I work on on that part. Yeah, I think that is critical in all of these. That's what we so often find. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But is it better to have a very new like idea, or is it okay to have somehow what related to your expertise? Well, you have to have some kind of expertise to make it believable that. Sure. Uh, you're going to be able to do that. So I did have, so what also helped me my second time was that I had gathered more experience in that and I had like some publications starting in that direction where I could say, look, I'm already familiar and more familiar than I was last time. I didn't say that, but I had more evidence of that and I had um, a better uh, preliminary results section where I kind of built up on what I described as the problem, and here's you know some results that we already got, but there's a lot left, and here's what's left, and how I'm going to do it. So, I just want to add to, to that. I'm on a panel right now and preparing for the it's not the career for NSF. The fourth question for both intellectual merit and broader impacts is how well qualified is the PI to conduct mm -hmm. the activity? So if you throw something out there that is not in your wheelhouse, mm -hmm. it will come out. 
pretty recent and you'll get you get from the other side. So M two for active machine learning and neural networks. I see a lot of this. I see a lot of this. And unless you can really make a compelling argument that it's not just a buzzword that you're throwing out there because other people are publishing it. Yeah. You really have to make be careful about it. Yeah. You do not have to have neural networks in your proposal to get funded. <laughs> and something I just want to throw in while I'm thinking about it is sometimes when people come to us that, that they just got here last fall and they have no preliminary data. And a lot of times we will tell people, you know, you have up until tenure and you have three shots. This may not be your best year if you don't have preliminary data to show that you know, you're already involved. So that's that's a consideration. You know, unless you've been a postdoc somewhere for a few years or something. You know, if, if you don't, if you're just jumping in, you might want to wait a year. Yeah. I, I completely agree and I would say if you're in your first year, I would definitely apply for the CRII program, which is again a precursor to the career. And it's really to help you build that experience and that knowledge and uh, get preliminary results that you can then use for your career application. And use it to, to, to establish that foundation. Yes. And yeah, within FSU, I'm sure you're all aware of FIAP program, use it. Yep. Take advantage of this. Mm -hmm. I, I would strongly, I would be very hesitant to submit something in your first year without any other prior support. So if I currently have funding from MSF or NIH, let's say I currently have some research money, does that count against me? Do the reviewers think that this guy already has some money, why give me more money? I have not seen that happen, that count against you. I, I had a grant already from MSF when I applied for my career award, um, and I mean, it, I don't think it counted against me since I, I got the career anyway. And being on the other side, I don't think that that was ever, I think somebody actually did bring it up, um, a reviewer on the panel, like this person already has two grants, two NSF grants, and the program director just stopped them and said, no, that's not a consideration for this. I do think, I do agree with that, although I will tell you in my own personal experience, that happened to me. I was told. I actually got the grant, but I didn't get the career because I had, he didn't need it, he had, and, but in, the, in all my experiences as a review on the panel, the program manager says, Nick's is that, and I think aptly so, because this is a career proposal that you're launching uh, early on. Next. So I had a question over here, this lady. Um, I was wondering about the postdoc thing, because all advice that I've gotten in chemistry is put a postdoc and a grad student in, because this is pretty much our only chance for the beginning, other than startup funds, to get a postdoc. And, I mean, at least for us, we need talented hands in the lab, which are not necessarily grad students for several years. And, I mean, part of the career is, of course, publishing, and of course, as much and as fast as you can. And so is that across the board that we shouldn't be applying for a postdoc? I, 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 I know more from a physics point of view. I don't know as much from a chemistry point of view. Uh, it's expensive. Well, maybe it's not so expensive in chemistry, but in physics, a postdoc is expensive. I mean, a postdoc is like 60000 with all benefits, right? That's what we pay grad students. That, that's what our grad student costs us about 55000 or that's a few years ago when I was administering our grant. About 55000 with all of the overhead, with all of the tuition, et cetera. Postdoc would, will count. And, and then your overhead is going to add another another 54%. What you might want to do is we have some awardees from chemistry. Um, talk to them. Yeah. I mean, I'm familiar with them. I'm but saying, like across, they, across the board, well, and, and this is coming from schools where postdocs are significantly more expensive and grad students are significantly more expensive. And so they're telling me, if you don't ask, you won't get it. And so what I've gotten as advice is, you know, ask for it. And worst comes to worst, you'll have to revise down to two grad students. Mm -hmm. So I would say definitely use your own discipline yeah. as the best guide, not only within your university, but outside. You probably have colleagues that you 
respect that you may talk to and ask about this. And the program manager. Yeah. Uh, it's like I said, every field has some differences. I mean, I would say this. In engineering, if you put in um, a postdoc, you're eating up most of your annual budget because you get five years, 500K. Yeah. Um, so I think our minimum right now is about $50,000. You, you put in insurance, fringe, and overhead, and you're you're right there, and then you have no summer salary. So I, you know, I to say maybe a portion of the post stop. Yeah, I would definitely say follow your particular field, and there's also NSF organizes writing workshops uh, for the career award for you know particular disciplines. So there's one for or CCF size that I went to and I found very, very useful. I've been to this panel, to this workshop before, and this was very useful to, to get me started and to have a general idea, but then I would also recommend go to the ones that are organized by NSF in your particular field, and that's when you're going to find out things that are specific to chemistry. And I found that very useful in, like, taking the general advice and then also narrowing it down to what applies to my field. So, for example, in, in CCF size, uh, usually you ask for one month of summer salary each year and one graduate student, and that's all that the money allows for. Um, so, and generally, that's that, that has been the guidelines also from the program director, one, for one graduate student and one month of summer salary. So, and that gets us to $500,000. So, um, mine was 494000 and something like that, and that's all I have. One month of summer salary and one graduate student for five years. With the overhead and everything, it really got me there, so. And I would think, I'm, I'm assuming, I would think with all that's going on, some of these workshops, they may be doing more web, WebEx type things. Probably. Yeah. People aren't doing a lot of in-person large group things. So you might have the opportunity to watch. But I, I bring up one, one issue you mentioned, uh, which is, well, ask for it, and then you may or may not get it. But it sounds like this is a fixed amount of money. Now, with our regular NSF proposals, it's certainly true that we can, that uh, w most often we will get, they will come back with a number less than we asked for. Uh, but I don't think that happens with the career. Right? I think, it's sort of a fixed amount of money. Uh, I did have to revise my budget. Okay. Um, but that was mostly because some things that I asked for were, like the program director thought it would be too much of a hassle. Uh, but it was mostly for the summer school, and I was asking for lunches for the 20 uh, middle school girls that I'm hosting, and he was like, oh, that's going to be problematic. Why don't you try to get sponsorship for the lunches? Because it might lead to you know a lot of paperwork that we need to file. And I was fine with that as long as he gave me a career award. So I did reduce my initial amount by about $5,000. It wasn't significant from that point of view. Whereas in a, in a different NSF um, award that I got, I had to more considerably reduce the amount when the program director came back. So um, I found that for the career, I mean, there was not much I could reduce anyway. It's, um, I have one student and one month of summer salary, so it wasn't like a lot of juggle. With me. So we have about five minutes left, so maybe one or two questions. How knowledgeable were you for the proposal that you received? What? How, How knowledgeable? Knowledgeable? Well, in my case, of course, it was very much my field. We, um, we get a questionnaire list all the proposals, and then we're asked to identify conflicts of interest that we know the person who are at the same university that immediately excludes them, and other ones that we feel like you know, extremely well qualified to do, qualified to do, or not in our area. And then generally, you know, the program manager takes that information and comes back and says, here's, here's my assignment. Does anybody have a problem with this? So generally speaking, you're reviewing things that you either have a very active interest in or some, certainly some experience with. 
Uh, so do, do you see the name of the person? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you have to look at their you know background and their publication, mm -hmm. see if they're qualified to do things. So it's not anonymous. I mean, no panel. Right. It's anonymous. not about anonymity, but there's the problem about personal relationship. Yeah, you declare that as a conflict of interest. Yeah, do they so just do know them or if you're like friends? Well, um, they have guidelines for conflict of interest, what represents conflict of interest, and also if you feel like you've got a personal relationship that prevents you from being objective, then you would declare that as a conflict of interest. So. And it could be negative as well as positive. That's true. On our, on our last, this is our, our umbrella grant, towards the end, one, one reviewer had to, had to be dumped because this reviewer was opposed to loaning some equipment to one of our faculty. And so we, we were a little surprised at, at how, how it get, conflict of interest gets, gets decided. One of our reviewers was a graduate about uh, 10 years earlier, but, but uh, his advisor was no longer part of our group. And also, I think you guys probably have guidelines on your website about this conflict I would also say that, you know, so there often are conflicts of interest. They're generally pretty benign. That person is in your department, okay, um, a junior colleague in your department. So that just means I can't review the proposal. When the proposal comes up, I leave the room. And then tell me when to come back. That's it. That's how that works. Yeah. I actually declared a conflict of interest with a close friend. I mean, we never published anything together, but... We're just good friends. I didn't feel like I was able to be objective when it came to her proposal, so I just declared it to be safe, and yeah, I left the room. I didn't know how, like, the program director at the end, kind of, um, so you see the ordering of the proposals on, on a board. Um, so, but he makes it such that if there's conflicts of interest, you won't exactly know the ordering. So you will know, like, a general picture, but you will never know if a proposal will get funded or Okay, it looks like we're at 9.50. I want to, oh, yes. Can I throw out one piece of advice that I wanted to make sure everybody got? Don't just let your department chair or department head write a letter. Make sure you're intimately involved with that letter because I can guarantee you in all the panels I'm in, we read that very carefully. So if, you're, if your department chair can say, spell out exactly how you're supported, what your startup package consists of. To justify, why does that matter? Well, because it's it's indication that you are able to do the research that you're talking about doing. The mentoring is particularly important because it's a career. So don't just take whatever they write. Make sure it's customized to you. And your department chair will most certainly be happy to do that. Any other last advice? Um, not really. I would just emphasize what, what we said before about getting involved with anything that the university can offer you for, for the educational uh, part and the outreach because, again, you have to not, not just propose something vague but something very concrete and very achievable. And you have to show that you have the means and the support from your university to do that. So I would say, yeah, we, we, have, we have resources at FSU specifically for that purpose, take advantage of those, and it will definitely make your proposal stronger. Thank you all of you so much.